At least a tablespoon, a good tablespoon, maybe a little more. And what I should have put here with my tomato paste, which I forgot, is a little bit of flour on top to give me a little bit of thickening agent in the biscuit at the end, you know, about a tablespoon and a half or so. Okay. And that, all the stock from the lobster in there. So remember that basically this is old stuff that you retrieved, that very often people throw out. We're gonna cook that for 15, 20 minutes, strain it, finish it with a little bit of cream and cognac, and that's one of the most elegant soup or bisque, lobster bisque that we do in French cooking. Come to a boil, about 15 minutes of cooking. With my lamb, it's really liquid in the center. I'm going to do a little bit of couscous. I have a cup of water here, a dash of salt, a dash of pepper. I'm putting a little bit of olive oil on top and a cup and a quarter of that instant couscous goes with it. All you do is to stir it. And that's it. Remember the water should be boiling hot, then cover it tight and let it by itself. Within five minutes or so, the thing will have seized and it'd be perfect couscous this way. Now the lamb has been cooking and to depressurize it, read the instruction on your manual because they're different. Sometimes you have a button here too. This one you push there. See the pressure is coming in that direction. Very often I put, I push something on top like this so that I don't put the steam all over the place or I cannot burn myself almost this way. And that's some time, you know, you do it until you hear no more noise. It will take a minute, minute and a half, two minutes. Oh, this one. That's it. So now, I'm, whoop, ram is beautiful. Ready? We'll observe that with our couscous. We can see that this in a few minutes, this gets finished. You want a so-called aigronné. We say in France, aigronné, that is to to uh, go it with a fork like that to separate the grain. Couscous is beautiful. There is a lot of liquid like that. It will absorb it. Now you can serve it on the side also. I have more than enough here. You can see that a, a cup, cup and a quarter of couscous will give me a lot of couscous. Put it around to do like a crown of it. Or maybe I put a little more here. Okay. And then my stew, I mean those legs. Boy, that smells good. Get a little more of the, the juice and the beans on top. On a cold winter, after skiing, you know, I know what Cloud and I want to eat. This is it. You bring that here. All right. And then I want to do a fast salad with this. You know, it's very simple. I take uh, eggplant like that and cut them in thin slice, you know, about a quarter of an inch. And you put them on a cookie sheet with a little bit of oil put the oil on the cookie sheet, rub it, press your eggplant in it, turn it upside down, salt it, of course, and then on a bed of watercress, we're going to arrange this. I always do that salad because Gloria loves that eggplant salad. She loves eggplant, but particularly done this way. And it's really a refreshing summer salad. You can cut your eggplant slightly bigger, slightly smaller, you know, that'd be great. Okay, and then the dressing, I put some garlic, kind of oriental dressing here. A little dash of sugar, a dash of pepper. I put soy sauce here, soy sauce. A little bit of uh, the dark sesame soil. 
that give you a very specific taste and it's strong, you don't put too much. Dash of Tabasco and a dash of like peanut or canola oil and oil which is not too strong, you know. You want to mix this, preferably with a, with a spoon. And you pull that all over the place. I have a bed of watercress underneath. And you can have all the type of lettuce if you don't have watercress, of course. Here we are. And then we go back to our bisque here. The bisque has been strained, reduced. It's reduced to about four cups. It's a very rich, beautiful soup. Finish that up with heavy cream. This is the classic way. In a classic restaurant, you'll pay a little fortune for a bisque like this. Or with a dash of cognac at the end, not much, but a few drops. And we're ready to serve our bisque here. You don't serve too much of it, but it's quite rich. Maybe a little dash of chives on top of it. And that's it. You're finished for a beautiful menu. And that's it. This is a beautiful menu, especially with the lamb. I need one of those rich, you know, Merlot type wine, which is going to be great with it. Whether you cook fast or whether you spend the whole weekend cooking, put a lot of love in your cooking. The food will taste much better. Happy cooking. A KQED television production. You know, one of the classic dish that we do is a mixture of pineapple and Kirschwasser, which is cherry brandy, a little bit of brown sugar here, and a nice sherbet, a raspberry sherbet. In the middle of it, a spring of mint, a cookie, and you have a great dessert. I'm Jacques Pépin. And this is fast food my way. Happy cooking. When I was a kid in France, my aunt used to do a dessert which was a kind of mock tiramisu. She used to do it with the little lu, they called the little lu, which were any French kid will know that those are kind of butter cookie that we used. So I'm doing a dessert very similar to that, simple, using ladyfinger, more in the style of a tiramisu. Those are both uh, ladyfinger and some are smaller, some are bigger depending where you buy them. So you can have a couple of package and use whatever you need. So what we'll do first, I have coffee here. I'm gonna put a couple of tablespoons of rum in my coffee and a little bit of sugar, like a tablespoon or so, just to soften it a little bit, stir it. This is my syrup. The coffee is barely lukewarm, cool. And then you can pour that on top of it. You wanna soak your lady finger here. And they do absorb quite a lot. And the next things, I have some mascarpone cheese here or the mascarpone cream rather, and the mascarpone of course is an Italian very rich cream. You could use something else, but this is quite nice. And I'm mixing that with sour cream, half and half about. Then about a good quarter of a cup of sugar, some vanilla, teaspoon, teaspoon and a half of vanilla, and that would be the center of my cake. So just mix it together, it's finished. You can see the lady finger is very soft now and there is no more moisture. All of the coffee rum has been absorbed. So this is it. What we're going to do is to line that up inside. Whoop. Even if it breaks, doesn't make any difference because 
basically it's going to be covered and I'll put three and then cut those in half not very important there what you want to do is really cover the whole base like this and then put some of your cream on top about a third of it then more lady finger same quantity And finally, you put the last, you know, the last layer on top, and then the rest of my sour cream. Use your rubber spatula or another spatula. That's it. And then we put the powdered chocolate on top of it here. That's it. You can use bitter chocolate here, as I'm doing, and it's sweet inside, so that gives it a, a contrast, you know. I just clean up the edge. Here we are. And that's it. Really take a few minutes to do, it's quite easy. So what we're going to do is to cover it. Otherwise the chocolate, as well as the sweet, will pick up taste in the refrigerator, you know. So you cover it tight and now it has to be refrigerated and the second dish or the first dish of our menu today is going to be trout a smoked trout with a special salad so what I have my smoked trout here we're going to start with a salad and in my salad I'm going to put chopped onion here a bit of onion about a third of a cup or so. So I have my onion here, tomato, a cup of uh, diced tomato, a couple of different types of olives, cilantro, putting it the whole leaf like that, it's fine in there. I love cilantro. If you don't like cilantro, put parsley, put a bit of chives. I'm gonna put some uh, salt and pepper. And finally, eggs. And I have an egg cutter here. And you see, you cut your egg this way to make slice. And you can see that that egg is beautifully uh, yellow inside without any green around the yolk. And I was very careful not to let it cook too long. And when it's cooked, to refresh it under cold water. That's what takes that green stuff out. So you cut it one side, you twist it, and you cut it the other side. We now have diced eggs, you know, and that's very easy. When I do an egg salad, that's always what I use. It's much easier than cutting it with a knife. You know? And what I have with that, simply some olive oil. I really don't need any acid in there. I think it would be milder just with a good extra virgin olive oil. That's a great salad. Beautiful color. Okay. The second thing that I want to serve with that trout is a mixture of horseradish and uh, you can use cream cheese or even sour cream. In that case, I'm using a soft cream cheese here. And that mixture of sour cream and cream cheese goes extremely well with smoked uh, fish as well as like boiled beef, that type of thing, that would work well with it. Dash of salt and of course ground pepper in it. You know, I use trout here, but uh, sometimes I use white fish, actually whatever I can find in the market. Even uh, actually smoke, uh, smoke bluefish is very good. Okay, so here is my right mixture here. Now the trout. You can see that those trout, that's what they are at the market. They are with the skin, except they have been bone out, as you can see this. Well, if I could, I would have bone a bone, a, a, a trout which was not bone out, because in order to get the bone out of it here, they cut on each side of the fillet, and this is full of tiny bone, which now have to be removed. 
If I smoke a trout that I've done or buy a trout or a white fish unborn, you take the skin out of it like I'm going to do here and as you can see the skin just comes out very easily, you know, from the bone fish. Here it is. And at that point, if that trout was whole, I would cut it in half here, the line, and I would pull this out, out of the bone, and all of the bone would stay right in the center. In that case here, I bought bone out trout, and I have to bone it out. So, uh, as I said, you can see, you can fill it up if you go with your finger, it's hard to see, but if you go with your finger, you will feel that all around here, there is a line of bone. So either you remove it, you know, with a tweezer, you know, this way, which is really a pain in the neck, or you can cut the whole strip out. And in our case here, we're going to use this. As you can see, the bone has been removed here. And what I would like to do when I do this is to break and try to keep the shape of the trout itself. You know? I'll check it out, see if there is no bone in it. At home when I do that, it's because my wife goes fishing or my friend Jean-Claude go fishing. They get a lot of trout in spring. I smoke my own trout, but this is of course much easier. You get that at the market. So, to finish the dish, very simply we're going to put our salad for one portion here. When you want to do what I'm doing here, which is actually doing an edge of a salad. I'm going to do an edge here. Put everything in the middle, not around the edge, and then push it with your spoon to create an edge. What I'm saying is that if you try to create the edge like that, you always mess up the thing. So you put everything in the center and spread it out. And here, we can put a nice leaves of lettuce in the center. Now I'm putting my cream. Yeah, the cream for the, the trout and breaking my trout right in the center of it. Trout is really good too with a nice crunchy bread, butter, and it, that's, that's great. So this is a terrific first course. You can take one of those olives, maybe put it in the center for color. And we can serve that with a nice crunchy bread like this that goes well with it. And now for the main course, we're going to do a mixture of cauliflower and have cauliflower here and chicken. You can see that that cauliflower is really hard. There is no brown spot on top of it and that's what you want to look for. And what we'll do here is to cut that part and the core. When I do a soup, for example, and I would use I would use practically all of that in my soup, especially if I'm going to do a, like a vegetable soup that I'm going to do a puree with. You can break this into your floweret. You see, when your cauliflower is whole, you can check it by going, and at the end, you're pulling out the skin. See, there is a skin, like you have in broccoli, right around the stem. Now, that skin here, it's very tender. On an old one, it's kind of tough and strong in taste. So if you have a, an old cauliflower, you want to do something elegant, you remove that, uh, that skin around. I do the same thing with the broccoli. With the broccoli, you have to do it. So we re cut that into floweret. I have salted water here, which is boiling. I'm gonna put that to cook right in there. Not on the stove. This one is still big. And this is going to come back to a boil and will cook about five, six, seven minutes. I like the vegetable cooked. I like them a little bit al dente, that is a little bit firm to the teeth, but uh, not, uh, not raw, you know? So there. I have another skillet and I'm going to do the chicken in it. And that chicken here, I have four breasts of chicken. 
So remember when you remove the skin particularly, like here I'm going to remove the skin, you can use a, a towel for this, it cook much faster without the skin. Those breasts of chicken are about four ounces, uh, maybe four, four and a half ounces, yes, and that's fine for one portion. So what we'll do there is putting a couple of tablespoons. Ooh. My fillet is hot. So just a little film, actually a little film of water in the bottom. A good tablespoon of butter in the middle of this. And that's going to create a stock for us to poach this in. So we call that cuir à blanc, cooking in white. That is, it doesn't pick up any color. By the time it finished cooking, that liquid will have basically evaporated. If there is a little bit left, we use it in the juice. So here, let me put salt on top of this, on each side, as well as freshly ground pepper here. That's it. And I put that directly to poach. I'm going to lower the heat. I don't want it to boil too fast, but to poach gently, about four or five minutes for that size. We have to reach our finger after the chicken. Let me check on this also. It will take uh, three, four more minutes to cook, and I'm going to do a sauce to serve with it. And what I use very often at home, I buy <coughs> red salsa in the supermarket. You can buy it fresh, or you can buy it sometime in jar, even sometime in can. Actually, the one in jar like this is kind of dark and pretty strong and, well, not very appetizing. So I like to do the fresh one and I can keep it for a couple of weeks. And it's very easy to do. I have tomato, onion in there, about two cups of tomato, just dice them. And uh, lemon juice, or lime juice in that case. I'm going to filter it right through my finger. The tomato will also render some of the juice. I have cilantro. I can put the cilantro, or maybe, maybe I'll cut it in pieces, but you don't want it to be too small. You can even Shred it, shred it with your, you know, with your hand. So it's really a, a cinch to do that type of salsa, which in Mexico they call pico de gallo, and then you serve that with a lot of different things. Now, pepper. Now I can see here I have a larger one. Those are jalapenos. The round one, which sometimes come also green, are called bonnet, or sometimes habaneros, and they are really, really hot. And the serrano, smaller than this one, is somewhat in between in terms of hotness. So the hotness is a question of how much you, uh, you, know, you tolerate and so forth. Remember that a great deal of it, a great deal of uh, the hotness is in the rib and in the, the seed. So if you remove those, and I always taste it anyway, because sometimes they are very mild and sometimes they are really hot. So if they are really mild, I even add this. And this one is pretty mild, I'm going to add the center of it. So this will cut fine. Into a little julienne like this, that is a little strip. Even the seed. Then I put them across and cut them the other side. That's it, all that goes in there. And a little bit of garlic. I have a head of garlic here. Hit it on the side and I separate your cloves. Now we'll put maybe two cloves of garlic here. And you can see when you have a clove of garlic, the first thing you do, you take the stem of it. You have to take the stem. So you might as well take the stem before you peel it because if you do it before you peel it, if you crush it a little bit like this, that will release the skin, and that skin is going to fall off very easily. If you don't remove that stem, that, uh, the flesh doesn't fall out of the skin. 
For now, we're going to crush it. To co you have to come to the end of your board here because the finger has to clear up the table. And you crush it. That really is the essential oil. Then you can rock it. Finish. Bit of garlic. I need a dash of salt in there. Let me check on my chicken. Mm, a little more. Maybe I'll turn them on the other side. They need maybe another minute or so. And as you can see, there is almost no liquid left, so they continue steaming in there. Now what I like to put in my salsa is a little bit of ketchup, just to give one or two tablespoons, to give a bit of thickening agent to the bottom. I have an organic ketchup here. This is great. We're getting better every day. When you see organic at the market, buy it. I do. Okay, and I make my salsa here. So I have garlic, onion, pico de gallo. You have that with uh, regular tortilla, or then you can do it with uh, the tacos, you know, those are really good. So for our recipe today, if I add that, I keep that in my refrigerator for a couple of weeks. Today I need for that about uh, a good half a cup, maybe a bit more of the salsa. And to that, I'm going to use a little bit of olive oil in there. This will be the sauce for our chicken. And I will also put checking my chicken. The chicken is Yeah, that's cooked. So I'm going to take the juice of that chicken and add it directly to to my salsa. Okay. And keep that warm on the side. I don't need the stove anymore. Keep that warm here. Now we'll check my cauliflower. Mm, maybe another minute or so. Well, the cauliflower are cooked now, I'm sure. So we're going to drain them out. What you want to do, you can put them in the sink or Use your tap, use your lid here, just to pour out the water. That's it. And we want to cut them into pieces. And what I do, I cut them directly into the pan like this with a knife. What I'll do first is to put the butter. I need a couple of tablespoons of butter in there. This, dash of salt pepper, and chives. Almost forget the chives. You can cut them in larger pieces like this to be a bit different. That's good. Maybe a bit more. I love chives. Family of the onion, you know? And then, just with your knife, you know, I cut them across like this. I like that better than in puree, really. Okay, that's about it. And mix it for the butter. I love cauliflower done this way. Okay, we have a nice bowl. All of that will go directly onto the bowl right here. And the chicken will sit right on top of it. So, you see that the chicken here has still a little bit of juice which comes out of the chicken again. So I'll do the same thing. I'll remove that here. And add the juice either on top of this or in my sauce, maybe on top of the cauliflower. Cut that in half. You can see that they are barely cooked inside, which is the way I like them. Here. Mm. 
That's it. Then our salsa on top of it. Maybe a little bit on the outside. I don't make too much of a mess. And that's a nice, easy dish to do, which my daughter Claudine loves. So here we are. The chicken, cauliflowers, a big dish of it. Our first course, and of course, that tiramisu here that you can now, as you can see, go right through it. It goes very easily because of, you can see the layer there and the top on top, it's holding together the way it should be. This is a fast, easy meal that we made for you today. I hope you're going to do it for your friend. I enjoy making it for you. Happy cooking. A KQED television production. This is the shrimp burger from Playa del Carmel, Dr. Tacos. You put cheese in there, American cheese, pepper, then the shrimp around, scallion, cook it a couple of minutes, then it's ready here. You put it on top, right onto a bun, a bit of hot salsa. This is a great lunch. I am Jacques Pépin and this is Fast Food My Way. Happy cooking. Today I'm going to cook for you a special type of cannelloni or lasagna you can do using those uh, bon ton wrapper, you know, the kind of Chinese pasta. And it's very easy to do. First thing that I do is the sauce. Take a can of tomato, directly in there. A little bit of uh, Italian seasoning. You can use Herbe de Provence, Italian seasoning. Use a couple of cloves of garlic, two, three cloves of garlic, salt, pepper, and some olive oil. And that's it. Sauce is ready. Emulsify it. I use this, actually. I use that sauce as a base for soup also. It's very easy to make. So here I have it here. It's a lot of sauce. And now the center of your cannelloni. I have of course ricotta cheese here. We put a couple of eggs in there. That's it. Some chives. And I'm going to put some chives right on top of the dish when it's finished. So I'm going to chop a little more chive than what I need now. Put a little bit in there and keep some for later. And that's all you want to do here and mix it. You know, there is different type of ricotta, of course, on the market. You can buy one without fat, one normal. I like a regular ricotta. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that mixed quite well. So that really takes no time to do. So first, I put some of the sauce in the bottom here. And then, as I say, we use those. And those happen to be quite large. You know, sometimes they are thinner. It really doesn't matter. And they are quite thin, you know. And this is kind of a, a fresh pasta. And I can do, actually, a lasagna by putting this in there, a 
little layer of that, another one, another one, put five or six of that, a bit of sauce on top, your cheese, and you have lasagna. This is exactly what I'm doing, except I'm rolling up in the shape of cannelloni. But you can do one or the other. So here, put that in there. Do, do like a big cigar, you know. That's set in there. And put it seam, seam down, you know, underneath. Again, all you have is to repeat this. About a third of a cup of, uh, of the mixture, you know, those are large cannelloni, as you can see. And I have the last one here. I want to get everything left. So I did six, six large cannelloni here. That's it. You put that in there. More sauce on top. You want the sauce to go somewhere in between, you know. Spread it. Mm. The sauce should be fairly thin. Could be even a bit thinner than that. The reason is that your pasta is soft, but it will still absorb liquid, you know. So the mozzarella cheese, nice, maybe a cup of it here. A bit of parmesan too. And that's it, we're in business. So that's going to go into the oven now. About 375 for like 30, 40 minutes. And that should be ready. Next, I wanted to do a very easy type of first course that I do often at home with beans. And in that case here, I use the large cannelli beans and you drain them out. You can use that with, uh, you know, black beans as well as cranberry beans, or actually even the smaller pea beans, navy beans, uh, great northern beans, all of those are kind of small white beans because we're going to do a puree with it anyway. So I put the vinegar, bit of vinegar in there, a good dash of Tabasco, I like it hot, couple of cloves of garlic, and for that maybe I'll crush the garlic a little bit to be sure that it's going to liquefy well, well maybe three cloves, to be sure that it's going to ground well, otherwise sometime in the, the whole clove of garlic like that turn around and you end up having larger pieces. So here a bit of olive oil, and that's it. I have my base. I use that, you know, at the first course sometime and sometime for aperitif. You serve it for aperitif, you know, on little toast and it's great. A kind of hummus, you know, the hummus which is done with chickpeas in kind of North African country. A bit of the same idea. That's probably where I get the idea anyway. So here we are. Here. Yeah. A nice bean puree. So now we just have to put it together. And there is a lot of things that I have here. I have some croutons I put in the oven, some scallion, I have black olives, I have anchovies, I will have smoked oyster, smoked oyster, even smoked mussel. You can use one or the other and it's fine. So this, maybe I'll cut a bit of that. Right there are the garnish or chives. Okay, so here. A nice portion here, yeah, good. A few croutons on top. We have the scallion. Right away, you know, you have a bit of color there. And the black olives here. Look at this. And if you want, then as I say, the smoked, smoked oyster is pretty strong. So you may want to put them or you want may want to omit it, or as I say, a few anchovy filet on top. This would be good. Probably put a dash of olive oil around though, like this. And even at the finish, if you want, I put a radish, slice of radish on top. That look good. Give you a bit of crunch, different color. And here we are. This is a great first course and very easy to make.
I'm going to do a little Charlotte, Charlotte of apple with granola in it. And we cook those apples usually in a caramel. And actually I have to start my caramel here. You know, there is different way of doing caramel. You can do a dry caramel, that is just put this into a skillet and let it turn into caramel. If you do that, however, you have to stir your sugar, otherwise it's going to burn on the outside and not be cooked inside. If you stir the sugar, however, it's probably going to make it crystallize. Crystallization is when the sugar forms into block, we call masse in France, it forms a mass. However, this is only important really when you do a sugar like to the bowl stage, that is when the sugar harden like a caramel but it's still white. At that point if it harden, if it crystallize, then you cannot use it. What I'm trying to say is that you can't really miss a caramel. You know, if you leave it long enough, it will turn into caramel one way or the other, you know. So, with this, it's going to take a couple of minutes, so we have time to uh, peel the apple. Actually, you know what, sometimes I peel the apple and sometimes I peel half of the apple and leave half of the peel in there, it gives some chewiness in, uh, in that dessert and it's fine too. This is a Golden Delicious, which is really a whole purpose apple. I love Golden Delicious. This happened to be uh, Macintosh. If you have Macintosh, Rum Beauty, Steinman, Macoon, or Palisand, those are soft apples which tend to break down when it's cooked. Sometimes it's important, sometimes it's not. For us, we're doing a, a Charlotte, we're packing the apple into a, a little container here. So even if they are soft, doesn't really matter that much. This is, of course, Granny Smith. So Granny Smith and Pippin are going to be firm. So here, took the center again. Realize that the way I use my knife here, it's important, but you have to be very careful when you use your knife this way. What I do, I put my thumb right in there and the knife goes around and I turn, you know, in a pivot like this to take that center out as I do here. But it's very important to put that thumb here. People don't that forget the thumb, it goes right through to your hand. So put that thumb to stop the knife, the same thing on this side, you see. So this is a technique that you learn in professional kitchen, and as I said, the center is removed in the same way. So that will be cut into large dice this way. And you need about a cup, cup and a quarter of apple per person. So here, I told you not to stir the caramel, only at the beginning a little bit, so that you know that the sugar is mixed with the water. So you keep it uncovered, and you have to cook it probably another uh, couple of minutes or so. You can see that the outside of the caramel, I mean, has a yellow color, which is a caramel color. Caramel is indicated by a color. At that point, I can stir it. I told you not to stir it. But by the time it gets to the caramel stage, it passes the level of crystallization. So you can stir it at that point, nothing will happen. So again, you can have it as dark as you want. This is about, it's a light caramel, you know, another 10, 15 seconds, it gets darker and darker. And it depends on your own taste. I think it's about fine here. So I'm gonna put a couple of tablespoons of butter, which goes in our recipe here, directly in our caramel, it will melt. With a beautiful color here. And my apple. You can see the caramel color here, which comes. And now I have no danger of, you know, burning the caramel because now a lot of juice are going to come out of the apple. And in fact, what you have to do, you cover it. So the juice will come out of the apple and it start boiling together. Then you remove the cover and cook it a little longer. Sometimes you don't even have to remove the cover depending the amount of moisture in the apple until the apple are nice and tender and caramelized. I want to check on my, my apple. You see, the apple are fine now. And what you want to do when they are, I can see that they are soft now and the juice is caramelized. So what we do in that recipe, I finish it up with some granola, pecan granola, you know, any type of granola that you have, that will eat a little bit of the moisture there. This it. And that basically it before we put it in the tambal. 
So the mixture is basically ready. I mean, you can actually use this as a brunch or even as a nice breakfast, you know, on a Sunday, like for Mother's Day or Father's Day, you want to do something nice, or for a birthday. And what we do here, what I do here is kind of crouton to fill up on top of those more. We're going to put it in those more. You can use a container, you know, something, actually you can cut it with this, any of those. Sometimes it's fine enough, sometimes it doesn't cut enough, but I mean, it gives you the mark of it. And you can trim it a little bit after. So here we are. I have different sides. This is your regular Pyrex bowl. This is another one. You can have little of those. It doesn't really matter. You're going to unmold it anyway. So, so let's see. Divide it into four. Thing like this. See the caramel now is really sticking to the apple. Which is what you want. All right. A little more on that one. You don't have to worry whether they are nice and flat because what we'll do, we're going to press this with the bread. So, you know, what I like to do is to put a little bit of butter on that bread and keep it butter side up like this. So that you can do ahead, of course. You can even have that done the day. That's how I made a mistake, to so have butter on each side. That will be even better. I think that Julia would be proud of me using that amount of butter. Yeah, this way. And even for a nice caramelization on top, you know, you can even put even a little bit of sugar on top of this, you know. Okay. That's ready to go into the oven. As I said, you can do that ahead. It's great. I want to check on my pasta. Oop, the pasta is ready here. I have my lasagna here. I have another one that I did here, which is actually just line up like a lasagna, which we can see here. You would cut that in four pieces. Like I'm going to cut the other one. Looks good. A lot of cheese. I know Claude is going to like that recipe. There is cheese in it. He loves the recipe. So here, the, your lasagna would probably actually be easier, I guess, to serve. Even see, it's nice and soft, you know, with the ricotta. Mm, it's good. And this one is my uh, cannelloni. Now I have to find out where they are separated. I've lost, oh, here they are. Here. And I have those large cannelloni. Probably going to make a mess out of it. No, hook them up this way. Here, well, one way or the other, it's about the same idea whether you do them flat or whether you do them you know, piled up like the lasagna. Maybe a bit of chive on top just for color. This is really home cooking, my style, and you're going to like it. It's nice and delicate, this. My father used to put parsley in all of his salad. He used to put parsley on his steak, on his vegetable. So I've done that parsley salad, you know, name after him, or I mean after his memory. So be sure to wash it properly, and this is a great dryer, you know, to dry your salad, because if you don't do this, you know, you may have two, three tablespoons sometimes of liquid left in your salad, and that destroy your dressing. See here, I twist it this way, and you can see that right there, you know, look at the amount of what I have in there. That could have been in my dressing and destroy my whole salad. So what I'm going to do is to serve that on a large toast like this. And what you want to do is to cut any type of large country bread like this. 
I do a large slice of this, like this one. This is about 10 inch, you know, 8, 9 inch across. See what you do here, you turn the bread as you go around, you do the same thing with a cake, you know, and then you're back at the place where you started, and then you can do the center. You know. And this, what I do, a little bit of uh, oil on top of that, you put that in a 400 degree oven and have it nice and roasted to put at a base for the salad. You know, this is the one that I have here. Those are nice and roasted. So, not only the parsley we put in it, but carrot. So about a cup, a cup, cup and a half of grated carrot. Have my friend Gloria Zimmerman does that salad all the time. And actually, most of the recipe I stole from her, you know. I'm a recipe stealer. So I should have about plenty of uh, carrot in there. Then I'm going to put a can of anchovy filet. Put the oil in there. Cut those in two or three pieces. You can break it in there. That's it. The rest of the oil. And the parsley. In there I have about four cups, at least four cups, maybe even a bit more of parsley. So the salt on top of it, and you know what, you want to do that salad a little bit ahead. That parsley is quite tough. I mean, this is, as you see, so-called Italian parsley or flat parsley instead of the curly parsley. And this is kind of tough, and it takes a little bit of a while to soften, you know. So that's what we have, so that's a very assertive salad. We have anchovy filet, we have a lot of ground paper, salt, this, and garlic we're going to put on top. Now look at that garlic. This is the big, the big, big elephant garlic. And uh, sometimes I use it in those salads because it's kind of mild, you know. It's kind of mild. And I like the flake that it does. So you want to remove the shell here, like a regular clove of garlic. If you see it a bit damaged, you trim it. Those are really very large. I mean, sometimes I, uh, I use them, but uh, I rarely so those are as big as that one. With the vegetable peeler again, it's great. Work fine. But a third of a cup, and as I say, those are quite mild. I use those flakes also. <coughs> I saute it in olive oil sometimes to put it on top of uh, like a fish, thing like that. You Or even in a salad, you know, you fry it. It's good. So my olive oil now. And you could you could put some uh, you could put some vinegar in it, but with the anchovy and all that, the garlic is strong enough, so I leave it at that. I mix this. I keep that salad two three days. You know, as I say, it soften. We serve it on toast. Okay. And then I serve that on the toast. I have that large toast here. So what you want to do? What I like to do is really actually cut that in for four people. I cut that in four, put it back on my plate so that right there, so that it's easier to cut it before than after. So we put the salad right on top of it. Here we are. So you can take your part of the toast, you know, and have it here. Good. And even add a bit more color on top. We put half cooked eggs. I have a half cooked egg here. You can cut it with uh, a knife or with an egg slicer. I want to do it coarsely here. And, you know, if you want to omit any of this, it's fine. I mean, this is the type of salad where you can improvise too. The base is the parsley, the anchovy, the garlic. And I even added here some pumpkin seed, which gives me a nice crunch, you know. So here I have a beautiful salad, which you can use even as a brunch main course. You know, that would be very nice. Or as a lunch main course. So... 
we have a very earth earthy type of meal today, you know, with a puree of white beans and then that salad and our cannelloni or uh, lasagna. And of course the dessert here, let's see how those things are doing. They're still pretty hot. You know, sometimes you may want to run your knife a little bit around to be sure that it's going to unmold. And then you can turn it on your crouton and shake it a little bit. That's it, you know. So it's caramelized. You can add a little bit of what's left inside. Put it right there. Especially my fingers are full of garlic, so. Here it is. And maybe this is on top of it, or on the side. That's a very earthy type of dessert, too. And with this, we need a glass of wine. And what else? I have a beautiful Chianti Classico here, serving with the lasagna and that great salad. Thank you for spending time in my kitchen with me. And happy cooking. A KQED television production. One of the best drink of the summer for me is the frosted pineapple. I make it with crushed ice, pineapple, honey, lime and rum in the blender. One second and it's ready. I'm Jacques Pepin. This is fast food my way. Happy cooking. I'm going to do a brandade of codfish today, which is a, a dish very specific to the south of France, using salted codfish that we call bacalao, very often, after the, the Portuguese name, or uh, salted codfish or bacalao. In French, it's moru salé. Yeah. So I do potato with it. I'm starting with a large potato like that, which is about, about three quarters of a pound, to cut it into dice. Here we are. And here is my bacalao. This is salted cut fish, and this is fairly thick one. When you use this, it could be a year old, sometimes more than a year old, so you have to soak it in water, sometimes 24 hours. And I soaked this one since last night, and you can change the water a couple of times. You can see that this one is really a beautiful one, very thick. And even the Portuguese, who are the specialists of that, prefer the one from Norway. They consider the Norwegian salted codfish, the bacalao, are the best. So this one is ready to go. And what I did with that, I put it in water, cover it with water, and bring it to a boil and simmer it five minutes. And now it has time to cool, it's still hot. And at that point, you want to clean it up. And that's what I'm going to do. You go flake by flake to see if there is any bone, any bone to it. I can feel some bone now. You can see those large, those large uh, bone here, you know? So be sure you go through it. I even test it at that point. It's quite desalted now, so I may have to put a little bit of salt in my mixture. I'm not sure yet. So you have it in there, garlic, put a lot of garlic, like five, six cloves of garlic, the potato, my potato, and fennel seed, 
A few fennel seeds is not that conventional, but I like the taste of it. Pepper. <laughs> 